Okay, our conversation about thermodynamics in chapter 16 resumes now with subsection 16.3, which covers the second and third laws of thermodynamics. Logical first question is, well, what was the first law of thermodynamics, right? Why are we skipping right to two and three? The first law of thermodynamics, though we didn't define it that way, was actually introduced last semester, the law of conservation of energy, right? During a physical or a chemical change, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So that covers number one. How about number two and three? Okay, number two resumes our con conversation about entropy from the first video from this chapter. Uh, now, most things that are spontaneous involve an increase in an entropy of the system. And that's what we were thinking about in 16.2, okay, increasing the entropy of the system, something going from solid to a gas phase, for example, would increase the entropy of the system via a spontaneous process. But there are plenty of exceptions to that rule. Okay? We're looking for a law of thermodynamics, something that has no exceptions. So we need something a little more useful. And that is the entropy change of the universe, right? That first term there, delta S sub so UNIV, delta S of the universe, the entropy change of the universe which is defined as the entropy change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings. And if we're thinking about the entropy change of the universe, we can use that predictor to get some better ideas about a truly spontaneous process and solidify our definitions. So let's return to thinking about thermal energy, which we said previously was a spontaneous process, right? Thermal energy flowing from high thermal energy hot to low thermal energy cold. Yeah, that's a spontaneous process, no exceptions there. And how that occurs, right? If we're thinking about the hot thing being our system, and therefore it's giving off thermal energy to the cold thing, the surroundings, right? The delta S of our system is losing heat because it's giving it to, to the surroundings. That means I have a negative Q yeah, over the temperature of my system, right? To give us the entropy definition, we mentioned this before. That heat is going to the surroundings, so that gives me a positive Q over here over the temperature of the surroundings. Yeah. If the temperature of the system is greater than the temperature of the surroundings, then our entropy increases. Yeah. And that's how these things spontaneously happen with the top. What's down here with the second bullet point and below is never true, okay? If, again, we're keeping the hotter object as the system, we never have a hotter object spontaneously gain more thermal energy. Okay. So what else are we thinking about? Notice those were defined as QREV, right? Reversible, we're thinking about that theoretical reversible process again. And if I want something to be reversible, then that means my system and my surroundings have to experience entropy changes that are equal in magnitude to one another, right? So they have the same number, but they're opposite in sign. Right? For those entropy values, they add together to zero, which means, right, it's Q over T, that my, in order for a reversible process to exist, right, those temperatures have to be equal. To one another. The heat flow has to be thermodynamically reversible. So we take all that information together, right, plus that definition for delta S of the universe, and what does it give us as a better predictor? We don't just think about delta S of the system. That's okay sometimes, but not all the time. The hard and fast rule, which is the second law of thermodynamics, tells us that every spontaneous process, every spontaneous change here on the side, causes an increase in the entropy of the universe specifically. No exceptions there. Everything that spontaneously happens causes an increase in the entropy of the universe overall. Okay. And that's all summarized nicely here in table 16.1. Right? Entropy of the universe has to increase for something to be spontaneous. It has to be greater than zero. Okay. Delta S of the universe is less than zero, well, then that's a non-spontaneous process, okay? Because remember, something is spontaneous one way, non-spontaneous the other way. 
And in the rare situation that delta s of the universe is exactly equal to zero, then that's where we have our system at equilibrium in a reversible process. Okay. So what I've got next here is a nice place to pause and check your understanding thinking about entropy. Uh, for these four processes, A, B, C, and D here, think about what's happening and is the entropy of the universe, here we're just really thinking about the system, increasing. Yeah, so pause the video, think about these, and then click to resume. Now if we look at A, we have solid sodium nitrate dissolving in an aqueous solution to form Na plus and NO3 minus. Okay, of course the entropy of the universe is increasing in that situation. It's breaking up to form more things, right? more microstates if we want to think about it that way. Okay, so something breaks up, there's more things, more randomness, more entropy. How about B, freezing of liquid water? Well, that goes against what we said in the first video, right? If it's going from a liquid to a solid, as we do in freezing, then that's decreasing entropy. So that would be a non-spontaneous process. C shows us the sublimation of CO2, right? Dry ice here going from solid carbon dioxide to gaseous carbon dioxide. Okay. Again, we're phase changing from a solid to a gas. It's more random. That's an increase in entropy, a spontaneous process. And if you've ever had a cooler of dry ice, you've seen that firsthand. Okay. Lastly, yep. here we've got CaCO going to CaO plus CO2. So that's a decomposition reaction. Going back to a little redox chemistry here. What are we looking at specifically? Okay, I had something that was a solid to start with, and then it went to a solid and a gas. Not only did it make more things, uh, but it also went from solid to making some gas. Uh, so again, the entropy has increased, and we would predict that to be a spontaneous process. What else do we have with the second law? Okay, I can do some adjustments to that formula, right? Delta S of the universe we said is equal to delta S of the system plus the surroundings. Those surroundings though are everything that's, you know, with the exception of the system. So if you're thinking about yourself as being the system, right, your surroundings aren't just the room you're in. They're everything else, everybody else around you, right, the rest of the building, neighborhood, etc. So the heat that's gained or lost, depending if that's a positive or negative Q by the surroundings, right, is often a negligible fraction. Okay. And that allows us to make a little bit of adjustment to that formula, right? We've changed delta S surroundings to Q surroundings over T, right? Now just thinking about heat of the surroundings and Q of the reversible process, as we mentioned before, approximates Q of the surroundings. Yeah, so just be on the lookout for that formula as well. How about our third law? That's coming up here on slide 31. Third law, easy, succinct. We've mentioned this a couple of times in the past. Right? The third law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a pure, perfect crystalline substance at zero degrees Kelvin, right, absolute zero, is equal to zero. Key thing is that it does have to be a perfect crystal that does not hold if there are any impurities in there. But if you have a pure perfect crystal at absolute zero, that entropy value is zero because everything has ceased moving. Right? All your atoms are only in one place. They're no longer vibrating. You only have one microstate. Okay. And these laws of thermodynamics are useful because what that allows us to do then is allows us to determine the temperature dependence of something's entropy. Okay, whatever we're thinking about then, if it's above absolute zero, which we'll always be dealing with, right? how does that temperature affect its entropy? Because we know it's in the calculation. We can derive entropy values under specific conditions. Right? We've talked about calorimetry in the past. Right? And then we can use those values to do calculations. We're typically going to be thinking about standard molar entropies. Okay? If you recall from back in chapter five, the standard state we're dealing with one mole of substance with a pressure of one bar at 298 Kelvin. 
If you meet those states, right, you're not just S, you're S not specifically, right? That not there, that little degree looking symbol tells you you're at standard state and the sub 298 tells you you're at 298 Kelvin. What do those calculations look like? Well, they're the exact same thing that we did for enthalpy, delta H. Okay. This is what was introduced as the second application of Hess's law using heat of formation. Products minus reactants gives you the heat of the reaction. We can do the same exact thing for calculating standard enthalpy. You take the sum of the standard molar entropies of your products minus the sum of the standard molar enthalpies of your reactants multiplied by their respective coefficients. Okay. Just like enthalpy in the past, those values would be given to you. All right? I would never expect you to memorize them. I'm not going to upload a demo video here because you can check your notes from chapter five, right? that second application of Hess's law. The formula would have looked exactly like what we just saw, okay? with the exception being that it would have H's instead of S's. Okay? Your entropies multiplied by their coefficients, add together all the products, add together all the reactants, right? Remembering also to multiply those by their coefficients, and then it's products minus reactants. That tells you the entropy change for your reaction. Okay. Here is an example calculation to show that off. Okay. Give it a try on your own. Figure out if that would be a spontaneous or non-spontaneous process. Okay. Then we will resume in video three with talking about Gibbs free energy.